Hello, dear friends, and welcome to the Geo Coast. Um, here I'm standing with Jerry Murphy, who, is, who serves as the center director for MARI, as chair of civil, structural, and environmental engineering at UCC, as leader of the International Energy Agency Bayern Energy Biogas Task, and as a vice director of UCC's ERI on the balcony of which we are standing. Hello, Jerry. Hello, Max. How are you? And thanks very much for finding the time to That's have good. a chat. And um, tell me, do you have more hours in a day than most humans do? How come you're managing to fulfill all these roles? Yeah, I work continuously. My life is work. I spend most of my days thinking about uh, sustainability, renewable energy, uh, and it's a very enjoyable process. We have fabulous young researchers, so interacting mm -hmm. with young researchers on innovative ideas is, is a very good way to spend my day. And I enjoy it. How many years have you been doing this type of research? Like? Uh, I would have done a master's back in the 90s, but I worked in industry for about 10 years mm -hmm. and I started a PhD relatively late. So I did a PhD in my mid 30s and I came into UCC when I was 40 and I'm now 53. Mm -hmm. So I've been 13 years in University College Cork working in research in, in basically gaseous renewable transport fuels and bioenergy systems mm -hmm. and energy systems. That's very interesting and timely topics. And what would be your main role among all the roles that I listed? Like, would it be the director of the Murray or what would you see as your main role? Like, Well, I, I try to partition my day. I, I would see myself in the university in the mornings, typically mm -hmm. uh, running the degree in civil engineering. Uh, and then in the afternoon, I come down here to the ERI and then I work on my research, either with my own research team. Um, and then obviously with MARI, we have a, a management team, but looking at the overarching project involving 200 researchers is, uh, is, is a very interesting process. So mm -hmm. we're looking at the extent of our research in energy in climate and in marine. Uh, so it's an interesting process. So the day is never short and the day is never boring. And maybe you can give a brief overview of, um, it, as I know, like recently you became the director of the Murray. Four Sun years. Four years now, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and can you give a general overview of the Murray? What is yeah. Murray about? Yeah, the Murray Centre began in 2013. It was one of the first Science Foundation Ireland centres. Initially, it was the Centre for Marine Renewable Energy. Um, uh, initially, I was a co-PI. Uh, that was six years ago, but four years ago, I took up reins as the director of mm -hmm. MARI. Uh, and MARI has evolved. It was necessary to evolve. Uh, the SFI Centre is based on having a certain portion of industry cash, and, and we felt it necessary to expand the centre to be a viable centre. So initially, we became the centre for marine and renewable energy. Uh, and by adding and, that allowed us to look at marine, at renewable energy, mm -hmm. and marine renewable energy. Uh, and our centre grew into a more holistic centre. Uh, initially, I would have looked at the concept of from ocean to end user. So mm -hmm. if you make energy in the water, there's a requirement to bring that energy to the end user. And end users require gas, they require liquid fuels, they require heating, they require electricity. So our centre evolved. and. Um, more recently, Brianna Gallagher has joined me as we're now two directors of MARI, uh, and we've transitioned now into energy, climate, and marine. So we see mm -hmm. three overarching areas, uh, and it becomes a very holistic centre because in MARI now we have microbiologists, electrical engineers, lawyers, marine scientists, mm -hmm. zoologists, civil engineers, electrical engineers. And when we look at a problem, we have a multifaceted multidisciplinary concept of the project. Mm -hmm. So before MRI, if I had an academic paper, it was me and a PhD student. Now there tends to be seven or eight authors mm -hmm. all having a different perspective. Okay. And tell me what would be your day-to-day -day duties as a director? What do you actually do as a director? Well, for, for example, we have a strategy document that will be finished this week. So we're looking at the strategy of MRI. MRI mm -hmm. uh, has a, um, a board of governors it has a scientific advisory committee. Mm -hmm. um, MARI has 200 researchers. MARI probably has 12 co-PIs who typically would be professors with great expertise in their area. 
so for example, most recently we have some platform PhDs. So we're funding uh, of the order of 20 PhDs across the center that reflect what we do. We're very much into collaboration. So we don't want someone in MRI, in UCC, in civil engineering working purely by themselves. We want them working with our colleagues in NUI Galway, mm -hmm. in Trinity, in University College Limerick. So we're looking so for- trying to encourage this collaboration. We're into, we want to have a collaborative process. We don't want silos. So if, if for example, we're looking at wood chips as a source of um, carbon neutral energy, uh, we would work with people who would look at particulate matter from combustion of wood mm -hmm. chips and say it might be good for carbon, but it's not good for air quality. So we try to get very, very different perspectives on a concept. We want people to collaborate. We want the sum of the parts to be far in excess of individuals working on their own. Mm -hmm. And tell me, how does your pers I know that your personal research interest would be mostly in the area of biogas, yes? Uh, well, yes, I'm bigger. I'm yeah. bigger, yeah. But like, that's what you, you made your career on mostly. Yeah. I suppose I, I, I would have an expertise yeah. uh, in biogas. But mm -hmm. for example, we have a project at the moment and we're working with offshore wind. So we have this concept of bringing offshore wind ashore. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to have a gigawatt wind farm in the east of Ireland by Dundalk, how do you bring it ashore? So we're looking at making hydrogen. So the concept oh, is it. you have a wind power, some of it is electricity, some of it is hydrogen. For example, London bus will run on hydrogen from an offshore wind farm okay. in Kent. Are you talking about producing hydrogen out at sea on the wind well, farm? Well, we, it could be at sea, but our preference is that you would bring it ashore, you would have electrolysis, and you would make hydrogen. From and what? What is the process for somebody who is not familiar with technology? Uh, typically, what you do with electricity is you split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. So, what probably isn't considered, people might be very happy with a one gigawatt offshore wind farm, but if that comes ashore, you're going to have power lines. You're going to have to run a very substantial electrical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of our coastal areas don't have the electrical capacity to bring that ashore or to bring that into the country. So we're saying you can make hydrogen. And that hydrogen could be used to run Dublin bus. It could be used in factories. So we're looking at converting the energy in the ocean into a product that can be used by the end consumer. And, and what's quite important is electricity is only 20% of energy, 40% is heat and 40% is transport. Mm -hmm. What you're saying that you can convert water with the help of electricity supplied from a wind farm into hydrogen and oxygen. oxygen. And then do you use both gases? Like do you, uh, oxygen just goes Oxygen is a, a, a very important product that also has an asset value. But I think hydrogen would be the, we would see hydrogen as an energy vector. So to us, uh, electric wire is an electric wire. Hydrogen is another vector to carry that energy into the end user. And sometimes, mm -hmm. if you're looking at haulage, if you're looking at long distance buses, they probably won't be electrified, but they might use a fuel cell and have hydrogen. So London mm -hmm. bus so will run on hydrogen. Using it, yeah, yeah. and that, uh, the buses are made in Balamina by Wright Brothers. So you're looking mm -hmm. at making buses in Ireland and using Irish wind to produce an hydrogen fuel. Um, to run buses in Ireland. But from, what, from the sound of it, like me, who knows not much about it, mm. do I understand correctly that emissions, in terms of emissions, it's more environmentally friendly than using methane, for example, is it? Well, uh, we would always look at the life cycle analysis. So methane of itself has a global warming potential of, of between 25 and 28. Mm -hmm. But a lot of our work also, we would look at um, agriculture. So if you look at agriculture, 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. And if you have a slurry tank that is open, it is emitting methane to the atmosphere mm -hmm. at a global warming potential of 24. Are you talking on the Irish scale or global or world well, scale? In Ireland, 30% of our greenhouse gas come from agriculture, but mm -hmm. across the planet, agriculture is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. So if you put slurry in a tank, you have methane, and methane will warm the atmosphere. So we're also looking at transport fuels produced mm -hmm. from slurry. So if you cover a slurry tank and you take that methane into a bus, that bus will burn it and release carbon dioxide, which is 25 times less warming than methane. So we would see greenhouse gas negative buses running on methane. So to say mm -hmm. methane is a pollutant is true, but biomethane is an excellent source of transport fuel because in the life cycle analysis, if you treat a waste, such as food waste or slurry, and make a fuel, 
the world is better off than mm -hmm. not of course, treating yeah. the waste. So you're actually using the waste, which is rotting anyway, for it's producing anyway. something useful. Like yeah. If, f for the moment, uh, the gas that people use for heating their houses comes from the earth, like geologists find the gas or oil reservoir, then they pump it out with exploration wells, and then it's supplied to the end user. So what you're saying that by producing biogas, we can replace this source, like, so it's, it, biogas is kind of, it's a, um, it's a, substitute it's a renewable for natural source. Gas. Yeah? And there are six gas grids in the EU who've committed to 100% substitution of natural gas mm -hmm. with biogas by 2050. Okay. So is there any commercial production in Ireland for biogas? There is, there is. It's small, but I mean, if you look at Denmark, for example, Denmark is probably producing 15% of natural gas from biological sources. Mm -hmm. So what Denmark has done is they have said in 2010, we will not spread slurry raw on the land by 2030. And at the moment, 50% of all slurries in Denmark go into biogas plants mm -hmm. and are put into the gas grid as renewable gas. So Denmark and Sweden would be world leaders in renewable gas. And if you go to Sweden, an awful lot of the bus services run on biomethane. And that could be from slaughter waste, from food okay. waste, from sewage sludge. Tell me, is the production process expensive to set up? For example, can each individual household set up their own production of biogas and use it for heating their homes? It is plausible. There is a, 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 an entrepreneur in the west of Cork who has a home heating biogas system. Our preference would be to follow the, the Danish model, my preference. Mm -hmm. uh, in Denmark, they have very, very extensive anaerobic digesters, which take feedstock from farms, from municipalities, and they upgrade the biogas and put it into the gas grid at scale. Mm -hmm. So they would be producing the equivalent of 20 million litres of diesel per plant. Okay. Uh, and they're large uh, technologies. Uh, and. What's quite important in this area is, is the circular economy concept. So rather than putting slurries on the land and having pathogens and eutrophication, mm -hmm. the slurry in Denmark is uh, digested, um, it produces gas, and they then have a biofertilizer, which has more mineral value, more fertilizer value than raw slurry. Okay, I remember over the years working in this building myself, like passing your laboratory that you have downstairs, there's a kind of nasty smell from it like a beautiful smell you said <laughs> so like can you tell me like what type of experiments you're doing there like are you converting just grass or seaweed into biogas or yeah our in our laboratory downstairs we have at this stage worked on 85 different organic substrates and converted them to either hydrogen uh, volatile fatty acids mm -hmm. um, hydrogen or methane. So we have many, many ingredients and we have a number of products. I, I think, think the, the most obnoxious smell would be from Olva Lactuca. Okay. Uh, this is sea lettuce and it's, uh, it's found extensively in, in long shallow estuaries which have a lot of mm -hmm. eutrophication from uh, either septic tanks or from uh, slurry application. It's uh, Olva Lactuca, the sea lettuce is about uh, five percent sulfur, mm -hmm. um, and it's so uh, that's what gives the smell. It gives the hydrogen sulfide smell. So you mentioned, like, um, so as I understand, like, there's actually coastal and marine aspects to the biogas work because some people might think it's only converting grass and waste into biogas, mm -hmm. but you actually can use seaweed. Yeah, yeah? we we've uh, we've done an awful lot of work in seaweed, and and from our perspective, we would see ourselves as world leading mm -hmm. in the production of fuel from seaweed. Okay. So there's many, many, many different, spe different species of seaweed. Can you use seaweed. kelp? Like, I think that's the most yeah. abundant in Ireland. Yeah. So there's the, the two kelps we spent a lot of time working on is Laminari digitata, mm -hmm. which is common yes. kelp, and Saccharina latissima, which is sugar kelp. Uh, and what we have found is that we have harvested them in January, February, March, April, May, June, July, Did you harvest September. them offshore or on, onshore? Like? Uh, we typically worked with the Dahi Amuraku Marine Research Centre. I suppose when we started, we didn't realise you can't just get a boat and take seaweed out of the water. You have to mm -hmm. go to someone who has a license. Yes. yes. Uh, even for the extent of our laboratory work, where we might have required maybe 50 kilograms over a year, we worked with uh, the Jahi Amaraku Marine Research Centre in West Cork, and we bought the seaweed from them. Okay. Uh, and they grow seaweed on limes. Uh, and what's of, of great interest to us is that if you fertilize seaweed, you make more seaweed. 
Okay. Uh, now, typically, you don't want to be spreading fertilizer in the ocean, but if your water is anyway contaminated, say from a fish farm, you mm -hmm. get more seaweed. Okay. So the concept we've been looking at is that we need to take food off the land. I mean, the, the biggest problem, according to the IPCC, is agriculture, is beef. We need to find different sources of food. Our perspective is, mm -hmm. if you have farmed fish, and we have lots of ocean in Ireland, we have lots of ocean on the planet, if you grow farmed fish, typically it's 10 times less carbon per calorie of farmed fish than beef. Mm -hmm. If you have farmed fish, you will have eutrophication of receiving water. So the idea is that we have integrated multitrophic aquaculture. You grow seaweed around the fish farm. The seaweed grows better because mm -hmm. it has nutrients. nutrients yeah. uh, and then the seaweed comes ashore. And our perspective is that seaweed goes into a biorefinery. Mm -hmm. So like most people would associate seaweed with probably food. Yeah, like, and then I know that it's used in the um, pharmaceutical industry for cosmetology, for making various creams and stuff, and as fertilizer for producing organic fertilizers. Mm. Yeah? Have you done cost-benefit analysis in terms of what is the most effective way of utilizing the seaweed for making fertilizers or for making biogas? Yeah, it, it's always the case that or food... Maybe, um, or maybe you have a byproduct of the biogas production which can be used after as fertilizer. We would see biogas being a byproduct. From our perspective, uh, you need to get the alginates and the phenols, polyphenols out of the seaweed mm -hmm. and you use them in, in the pharmaceutical sector, in the food sector, in the chemical sector and what's left behind is digested. So there's a plant in Denmark, Solrod biogas plant, and there is two factories nearby that produce gelling agents and ingredients and their byproduct goes to the biogas plant. They also have cast seaweed. So that seaweed on the beach that's rotting, that's taken off the seaweed into the biogas plant. Byproducts from the uh, seaweed food plant goes into the biogas plant. And then you have energy. But so you also have... Basically, you don't need to use good quality fresh seaweed for producing biogas. You can use a byproduct of yes. yeah. other, other, other products. And, and, and what's interesting is we found that in um, Ascophyllomidosum, bladderac, mm -hmm that the polyphenols increase in the summer and the polyphenols inhibit the anaerobic digestion. Mm -hmm. So it's better to take out the polyphenols and use them and you get more gas from the seaweed that's left behind. So this is a relatively new area, but Ireland hugely underutilizes its seaweed resource. We have, I don't know, three and a half thousand kilometers of coastline. Mm -hmm. Our harvest of seaweed is very, very low. I mean, I spend a lot of time in China uh, and every time I eat out in China, I'm fed seaweed. We don't eat seaweed in our diet. We don't use seaweed as much as we could. Mm -hmm. So to me, there's great potential to grow seaweed. I would not be an advocate of going into bays in West Cork and um, harvesting natural seaweed. Why? Uh, to me, seaweed is a very, very important part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not a fan of going into an existing kelp forest and cutting it down. My perspective is you grow at sea. And there's a, an EU project called At Sea uh, which looks at membranes which are rolled off the back of the ship, mm -hmm. which are covered in, um, in spawn from seaweed. To me, that is the way forward. We, we grow seaweed, new seaweed, at sea, around fish farms. I have colleagues in Norway who grow seaweed in bays that are eutrophied to clean the bay. So to me, any seaweed we use should be our cultivated seaweed. And seaweed will also absorb CO2 mm -hmm. out of the atmosphere. So you're sequestering carbon, you're cleaning receiving waters, you're not taking away the natural forests that are there. I mean, kelp forests can be massive, they can be absolutely huge. Uh, I would not be an advocate of, of cutting mm -hmm. them down.